Hello and welcome to this exploring session and today we are looking at the troublesome reign of King John attributed to George Peel printed in uh, 1591 and presumably coming into existence a few years earlier than that. It is printed with uh, as two parts as a two-parter uh, though this may very much be the invention of the publisher. Uh, there are also uh, introductory epistles to each uh, of the part uh, which sort of read like prologues but also uh, uh, could just be uh, uh, something added to the edition uh, for the readers at home certainly as it's called to the gentleman readers one suggests that that's not a performative uh, a bit of text but maybe it is maybe it's just been adapted who knows we'll find out in a minute there's lots of things to be asking about this play we're doing it over four sessions of varying lengths because there are several scenes which are irritatingly long exactly the point where I want to pause this, uh, our read through um, so uh, some sessions are going to be longer than others. Um, of course, uh, you may be thinking of this play, The Troublesome Reign of King John. You're obviously in your mind's eye and everyone's going to be thinking this. You're thinking in your head, of course, King John, the famous play King John by John Bale, which is, of course, the one we're all <laughs> thinking of now, we, which you can go back and watch the videos of. We have looked at that play uh, and King John turns up in a lot of plays so there will be other plays that further down the line which will feature him uh, but for the moment we've only we've only done done him twice uh, if we include today um, which I am because we're doing it now so without further ado let's introduce you to the team who are going to be reading the first four scenes today so uh, reading uh, the part of King John himself is muted Alexandra um, clueless but keen <laughs> and uh, reading uh, the uh, introductory epistle to the readers, uh, Chatillon and Blanche today is... Uh, Lois, retired academic, living in London. And reading uh, Lady Falconbridge and Limoges <laughs> is... A leaky chapel, also clueless but keen. <laughs> uh, reading uh, the sheriff, uh, Lewis and first citizen today is... Hi, I'm Alan Scott. I'm neither an actor nor an academic, and I'm based in Suffolk. And uh, reading Queen Eleanor and an English Herald is... Hi, I'm Sarah Blake. I'm an actor, writer and director based in Germany. And new to the session today, uh, joining us for the first time reading uh, Essex and King Philip is... I'm Eric and um, I'm here <laughs> to try and see what happens. <laughs> Yeah. I love the save on that sentence midway through. Uh, <laughs> um, reading Robert and Constance today is... Hello, I'm Lynn Freitas. I'm a writing teacher living in the northwest of the United States. And uh, today, uh, uh, a complete bastard is... Uh, no, reading uh, the, the bastard <laughs> is... Hi, I'm Steve Longstaff, based in the northwest of England. And I am your host, Robert Crichton. Uh, I'm going to be reading uh, some stage directions and filling in for a few other uh, parts as we go along. Uh, so we shall see how that goes. Uh, so I'm going to start off with uh, what may not be a theatrical uh, bit of text, but we'll start off with it anyway. To the gentlemen readers, please, Lois. You that with friendly grace of smoothed brow have entertained the Scythian Tamburlaine, and given applause unto an infidel, vouchsafe to welcome with like courtesy a warlike Christian and your countrymen. For Christ's true faith endured he many a storm and set himself against the man of Rome until base treason by a damned wight did all his former triumphs put to flight. Accept of it, sweet gentles, in good sort, and think it was prepared for your disport. And yeah, there we have uh, our little introductory epistle. Uh, does it work as theater um, or uh, how are we feeling? It's obviously talking about Tamburlaine, um, that, uh, that, that famous chap and uh, theatrical success. Do what, any thoughts on that very brief bit of verse? <sighs> Silence from the room. <laughs> oh, Alan. <laughs> Well, it, it would do is uh, basically show up and turn your mobiles off. 
Mm-hmm. We're, always, we're always keen for one of those. Uh, I like that in a prologue. Anyone else? Um, Alexandra. Yeah, it just with the with the reference to Tamburlaine, it's sort of one. It's set up. We are the company that did that. That remember us? You know, we th- you loved us in whatever it is from the makers of some other movie. It, it feels a lot like that. That that's where my mind immediately went. <laughs> from the producers of Tamburlaine. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, I don't think it is the same producers of Tamburlaine, but um, <laughs> uh, never mind. Uh, if you liked that, you'll love this. Uh, Lois. Yes, it seemed to me that although it, it sounds theatrical, it's also really rather confrontational. You know, you like that atheist Tamburlaine who, who was condemned a lot for being an atheist. And uh, now here is something that you really ought to like, uh, but, you know, will you? I don't know. It just seems to me that you can see almost that it's from another company uh, that is being set up in opposition to Tamburlaine. Mm-hmm. Stephen? Uh, infidel and faith. So we, we, we start with the infidel and then we, we hear about John Faith. But so there's, there is that opposition at work, isn't there? Mm. Uh, Sarah? I know it's an easy bait to rise to, but I do love the fact that it's specifically addressed to the gentleman readers. Because, <laughs> you know, women didn't read. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, they did, but they're, they're not as far as the market was concerned, shall we say. Or yeah. this printer was concerned, yes. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. good point. Uh, any additional thoughts before we move on? It's not a long, long chunk. I don't want to uh, get too bogged down. Lynn? Yeah, just... Um... Maybe for the for the listeners at home, uh, you'll notice that we that we talked about John's relationship to that man of Rome. So, yeah, perhaps we sh- should make it clear that in the in the early modern period, um, the important thing about King John is that he had this conflict with the Pope. That there was this this re- religious conflict. So he was framed as kind of a proto Protestant. The whole Robin Hood thing much later we're not so uh, be prepared to be disappointed no robin hood here so king john the brexiter is that what we're going for here <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay let's uh, let's uh, move forward however uh, alan hold on to that for the mo- uh, thought for the moment see if we can squeeze it in later let's get into some action in the play uh, so let's start with scene number one um Enter King John, Queen Eleanor, his mother, uh, William Marshall, uh, Earl of Pembroke, the Earls of Essex and of Salisbury. Queen Eleanor speaks first. Barons of England and my noble lords, though God and fortune have bereft from us victorious Richard, scourge of infidels, and clad this land in stole of dismal hue, Yet give me leave to joy, and joy you all, that from this womb hath sprung a second hope, a king that may in rule and virtue both succeed his brother in his empery. My gracious mother queen and barons all, though far unworthy of so high a place as is the throne of mighty England's king, yet John, your lord, contented uncontent will, as he may, sustain the heavy yoke of pressing cares that hang upon a crown. My Lord of Pembroke and Lord Salisbury, admit the Lord Chatillion to our presence, that we may know what Philip, King of France, by his ambassadors requires of us. And exit uh, Pembroke and Salisbury. Dare lay my hand that Eleanor can guess where to this weighty embassade doth tend, If of my nephew Arthur and his claim, then say, my son, I have not missed my aim. And uh, enter Chatillon with, and the two earls returning Pembroke Salisbury back in the room. My lord Chatillon, welcome into England. How fares our brother Philip, King of France? His highness at my coming was in health and willed me to salute your majesty and say the message he hath given in charge. And spare not, man, we are prepared to hear. Philip, by the grace of God, most Christian king of France, having taken into his guardian and protection Arthur, Duke of Bretagne, son and heir to Geoffrey, thine elder brother, requireth in the behalf of the same Arthur the kingdom of England, 
with the Lordship of Ireland, Poitiers, Anjou, Touraine, Maine, and I attend thine answer. Small request, belike. He makes account that England, Ireland, Poitiers, Anjou, Touraine, Maine are nothing for a king to give at once. I wonder what he means to leave for me. Tell Philip he may keep his lords at home with greater honour than to send them thus on ambassades that not concern himself, or if they did, would yield but small return. Is this thine answer? It is, and too good an answer for so proud a message. Then, King of England, in my master's name and in Prince Arthur, Duke of Breton's name, I do defy thee as an enemy and wish thee to prepare for bloody wars. My lord, that stands upon defiance thus, commend me to my nephew. Tell the boy that I, Queen Eleanor, his grandmother, upon my blessing charge him leave his arms where to his headstrong mother pricks him so. Her pride we know, and know her for a dam that will not stick to bring him to his end, so she may bring herself to rule a realm. Next, wish him to forsake the King of France, and come to me, and to his uncle here, and he shall want for nothing at our hands. This shall I do, and thus I take my leave. Pembroke, convey him safely to the sea, but not in haste. For as we are advised, we need to be in France as soon as he, to fortify such towns as we possess in Anjou, Touraine, and in Normandy. Exit Chatillon with Pembroke. Uh, so now we have a mass entry of people enter the Sheriff of North, uh, Northamptonshire, uh, Thomas uh, Newdigate with Margaret, Lady Falconbridge, uh, all sorts of things. I'm reading from two different uh, stage direction uh, notes here, so this is getting a bit confusing. Um, Philip and Robert Falkenbridge and their mother with Lady Falkenbridge, yes. And the sheriff whispers the uh, uh, to the Earl of Salisbury in the ear. Um, and uh, for the moment, Salisbury is going to be read by Aliki. Please it, your majesty, here is a sheriff of Northamptonshire with certain persons oh, that of late committed a riot and have appealed to your majesty, beseeching your highness for special cause to hear them. Will them come near, and while we hear the cause, go Salisbury and make provision. We mean with speed to pass the sea to France. And exit Salisbury, but we're going to just pause there to recap because we're going to move into a slightly different area of the scene. So um, uh, where are we in the plot? What's going on with the plot? What's going on with John and, and, and the rest of the world? Um, anyone wants to do a mini recap or just thoughts about what's just going on? Exposition City here, people. Um, uh, Aliki. Okay, so briefly as I remember this, Geoffrey, the eldest son of Henry II, revolted against him and was killed in battle. So I guess that's his son, Arthur, who is being put up by the French king as heir to the English throne um, in the place of John, who is the youngest son of Henry II. And, and all of his other brothers reigned before him, I think. Well, Richard did, anyway. Mm. <laughs> Alexander. Jeffrey died before. Uh, yes, I have a slight yeah. adjustment to that. So um, Henry was the eldest son. He oh, got killed. Of course. He I had no pardon. heirs. Yes. He was followed by Richard, who became Richard the Lionheart. Yeah. Jeffrey, who died before he had a chance to become king as well. And then John. So Jeffrey is the third son, but he comes mm -hmm. before John, who's the fourth. He died, but left an heir, a male heir, and so France is supporting that claim over the claim of John. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, so, bit of bit of uh, back and forth going on about that, and uh, yes, uh, lots of politicking going on. How, how are people finding this as an opening to a play? Uh, uh, any 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 issues or problems, or, or are you enjoying what's going on? Where 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 do you think you are? Uh, wave at me, or if you're uh, Eric, just jump in uh, randomly because you're only a voice. Uh, Stephen. Uh, well, uh, this 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 sort of scene turns up in the middle of the famous victories, um, um, but it there is um, a, a fairly well known ambassador's arriving scene which starts another play. Mm, yeah, so but, I'm, but I'm wondering famous because victories, famous victories yeah. is a Queen's Man play as well, isn't it? So I'm wondering which way round it came. And, and which theatrical memory is being triggered by which. Mm. So it's a company reusing a, a, a 
sort of seen it framework. Mm. Um, I think uh, orthodox dating puts famous victories slightly earlier than this, but it's a close run thing. They're pretty much on top of each other, I think, in where people generally date them. Um, but yeah, um, same ideas. People like the, obviously like this kind of uh, this kind of thing, perhaps. Um, other thoughts? Well, I think if this were a film, this would be the bit where they're starting to, because it's the beginning, they're just setting up for like a big fight scene because people like gore and they like sort of, you know, the anxiety of like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Is it going to resolve diplomatically or not? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, you know, if if it was Star Wars, this would all probably be kept in the opening uh, uh, credits, uh, blue, blue, uh, yellow, uh, yellow, uh, <laughs> scrolling uh, text. I, I, I... <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go into the battle. Um, uh, other thoughts? But it is setting aside that we have seen this in other places. Um, on its own merits, it's actually a really concise and effective way of setting up the plot and the characters and the um, uh, our allegiances, I guess, as as the audience. Because of course we can't be on the side of the French. They're the French. Um, so we've established quite a lot of things in a very short space of time. What is that? Two pages? Three pages? Mm. Yeah, we're uh, yeah, it's uh, barely a hundred lines yet. Um, uh, uh, One of the things we've had established as well is is Eleanor's role in all of this, which is you know the the kind of what we're going to end up with a bit later on is sort of grandmother versus mother, and the, the kind of an exploration there of just how um, you know when grandparents attack, as it were. <laughs> and that's that again concisely very very concisely stated you know the reason it's actually his mum the cow she wants to be queen you know. do you know what i mean and it's in about two lines isn't it and thrown away really but it's it's preparing us for later on mm. well yeah queen eleanor is no stranger to the workings of power and ambition mm. so um, yes, being careful not to read too far ahead. Um, the, Queen Eleanor herself, how did you, you, you went for, you went for an interpretation there. You went for it for, for full, full, full throttle, uh, liked that. Well, it was cause it said in the stage directions that she was the queen mother. So I thought, well, okay. Um, I, I just hope to God she doesn't have that much dialogue. The women don't normally. So I'm, 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 I'm betting that she doesn't because I can't keep that going. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 you are free to change your interpretation yes. as you go. That's it. She, yeah, might, she might suddenly go terribly common. Um, <laughs> she was from the south of France, so... <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's true, actually. That's, that's entirely inappropriate, what I chose to do there, but never mind. <laughs> just, send, just send for another bottle of gin. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly, another packet of black cat. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I just... I do like plays where, the, where they get straight down to the conflict. It's like, no messing about. Get in there. This is what's going on, you know, straight straight into the conflict. Everybody's already having a go at each other. It's yeah, it's it's kind of uh, entertaining. She, I mean, she is clearly um, a woman who knows her mind. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but as I say, I'm guessing she probably hasn't got that much to do. I shouldn't say that because maybe I'm going to have like a four page speech. But like, um, that's never happened before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm thinking she's sort of uh, she's been set up here as um, sort of you know pulling strings behind the scenes, but it will be interesting to see actually how how much of a role she has in the play. Mm. Um, and you know, because she starts off by talking about you know Richard, uh, you know, the person who's not there, um, mm. you know, Hong Kong, uh, and of course using that traditional thing of uh, saying how great a king is by how many people he's possibly killed, especially from another country, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, scourge of infidels. You know, it's that kind of thing that you know then is 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 a great compliment, but today is uh, slightly slightly more problematic. Um, yeah, uh, but wasn't he quite a terrible king? Uh, like, because he was absent all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, he was awful. So, he was away on the crusades. Country. Yeah, he was away on crusades, which is why he's the scourge of infidels. Because you know, he, yeah, he did yeah. a really great job all the way over there, where he got captured and then spent about six years in prison, and we had to ransom him by by basically selling a whole chunk of of uh, land. Yeah, yeah, he was great. We... He was adorable. <laughs> he was perfect. But yeah. Eleanor got to rule 
got to to be regent in his stead. I don't know if it was over England or Aquitaine, but she got to basically be in charge for a whole bunch of time. Mm. Yes, so historically she was that. Um, but it's understandable that she would be going, yeah, he was great, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looking looking pointedly at John. Uh, <laughs> Lynn? Yeah, the, the other sort of ahistorical thing to note here is the, the, the sense that the uh, the Angevin Empire was centered in England, which it was not. England was an outlier province. They, these were Normans. Normandy and, and Aquitaine were much more valuable properties than England. So that, you know, the framing of John as the king of England with properties in France is really the opposite of, of how they would have thought of themselves. Is like, we're, and they would have been speaking Norman French in court. So, you know, these are actually French people with, you know, a conquered kingdom across the channel. Mm. But, uh, but that's, yes. not how we're, that's not the fiction, though. No, that's not, not the, the world that's being painted here. We're going to move on. Uh, this is a long scene. I don't know if we'll pause in the middle of it or I'll just let it give it its head now that we've sort of bedded ourselves in a bit because we're having a new plot line, as it were, a different plot line approaching uh, any second now in uh, uh, questions of legitimacy. Uh, so as Salisbury exits, King John continues uh, talking to the uh, Sheriff Shreve, who has just entered. Say, Shreve, what are these men? What have they done? Or where to tends the course of this appeal? Please, Your Majesty, these two brethren, unnaturally falling at odds about their father's living, have broken Your Highness peace in seeking to right their own wrongs without cause of law and order of justice, and unlawfully assembled themselves in a mutinous manner, having committed a riot, appealing from trials in their country to Your Highness, and here I, Thomas Newdigate, Sheriff of Northamptonshire, do deliver them over to their trial. My Lord of Essex, will the offenders to stand forth and tell the cause of their quarrel? Gentlemen, it is the King's pleasure that you discover your griefs, and doubt not, but you shall have justice. Please, it, Your Majesty, the wrong is mine. Yet will I abide all wrongs before I once open my mouth to unrip the shameful slapper of my parents? the dishonour of myself and the wicked dealing of my brother in this princely assembly. Then, by my prince his leave, shall Robert speak and tell your majesty what right I have to offer wrong, as he accounteth wrong. My father, not unknown unto your grace, received his spurs of knighthood in the field at kingly Richard's hand in Palestine, when as the walls of Acon gave him way. His name, Sir Robert Falconbridge of Montbury. What by succession from his ancestors and warlike service under England's arms, his living did amount to, at his death, 2,000 marks revenue every year. And this, my lord, I challenge for my right as lawful heir to Robert Falconbridge. A firstborn son be heir indubitable by certain right of England's ancient law. How should myself make any other doubt but I am heir? to Robert Falconbridge. Fond youth, to trouble these our princely ears, or make a question in so plain a case. Speak, is this man thine elder brother born? Please it your grace with patience, for to hear I, I not deny, but he my elder is, my elder brother too, yet in such sort as he can make no title to the land. A doubtful tale as ever I did hear. Thy brother and thy elder and no heir. Explain this dark enigma. I grant, my lord, he is my mother's son, base born and base begot, no Falconbridge. Indeed, the world reputes him lawful heir. My father in his life did count him so. And here my mother stands to prove him so. But I, my lord, can prove and do aver both to my mother's shame and his reproach. He is no heir, nor yet legitimate. Then, gracious Lord, let Falconbridge enjoy the living that belongs to Falconbridge, and let him not possess another's right. Prove this, the land is thine by England's law. <clears throat> Ungracious youth, to rip thy mother's shame, the womb from whence thou didst thy being take. All honest ears abhor thy wickedness, but gold, I see, doth beat down nature's law. 
and Lady Falconbridge kneels uh, down. My gracious lord, and you, thrice reverend dame, that see the tears distilling from mine eyes and scalding sighs blown from a rendered heart, for honour and regard of womanhood, let me entreat to be commanded hence. Let not these ears receive the hissing sound of such a viper who with poisoned words doth macerate the bowels of my soul. Lady, stand up, be patient for a while, and fellow, say, whose bastard is thy brother? Not, not for myself, nor for my mother now, but for the honour of so brave a man whom he accuseth with adultery. Here I beseech your grace upon my knees to count him mad and so dismiss us hence. Nor mad nor mazed, but well advised, charge thee before his royal presence here to be a bastard to King Richard's self, son to your grace and to and your to and brother to your majesty, thus bluntly and young man, thou needst not be ashamed of thy kin nor of thy sire. But forward with thy proof. The proof so plain, the argument so strong, as that your highness and these noble lords, all and all shall save those that have no eyes to see, shall swear him to be bastard to the king. First, when my father was ambassador in Germany unto the emperor, the king lay often at my father's house, and all the realms suspected what befell. And at my father's back return again, my mother was delivered, as tis said, six weeks before the account my father made. What more than this? Look but on Philip's face, his features, actions, and his lineaments. And all this princely presence shall confess he is no other but King Richard's son. Thus then, gracious Lord, rest he King Richard's son, and let me rest safe in my father's right that am his rightful son and only heir. Is this thy proof and all thou hast to say? I have no more, nor need I greater proof. First, where thou saidst, in absence of thy sire, my brother often lodged in his house, and what of that, base groom, to slander him that honest his ambassador so much, in absence of the man, to cheer the wife? This will not hold. Proceed unto the next. Thou sayst she teemed six weeks before her time. Why, good Sir Squire, are you so cunning grown to make account of women's reckonings? Spit in your hand and to your other proofs. Many mischances happen such affairs to make a woman come before her time. And where thou sayst he looketh like the king in action, feature, and proportion, therein I hold with thee, for in my life I never saw so lively counterfeit of Richard Coeur de Leon as in him. Then, good my lord, be you indifferent judge, and let me have my living and my right. Nay, here you saw you run away too fast. Knew you not omne simile non est idem, or have read in... Ahark ye, good sir, t'was thus I warrant, and no otherwise, she lay with Sir Robert your father, and thought upon King Richard my son, and so your brother was formed in this fashion. Madam, you wrong me thus to jest it out. I crave my right, King John, as thou art king, so be thou just, and let me have my right. Ay, foolish boy, thy proofs are frivolous, nor canst thou challenge anything thereby, but thou shalt see how I will help thy claim. This is my doom, and this, my doom, shall stand irrevocable as I am King of England, for thou knowst not. Well, ask of them that know, his mother and himself shall end this strife, and as they say, so shall thy living pass. My lord, herein I challenge you of wrong to give away my right and put the doom unto themselves. Can there be likelihood that she will lose or he will give the living from himself? It may not be, my lord. Why should it be? And here I have a random stage direction of a comes forward. Lords, keep him back and let him hear the doom. Essex. First ask the mother thrice, who was his sire, who was his sire?
Uh, Essex. Sorry, apologies. I thought I had unmuted. Um, Lady Margaret, widow of Falconbridge, who was father to thy son Philip? Please, it your majesty, Sir Robert Falconbridge. This is right. Ask my fellow there if I be thief. Ask Philip whose son he is. Philip, who was thy father? Mass, well, my lord, that's a question. And you're not taking some pains with her before. I should have desired you to ask my mother. Say who was thy father. Faith, my lord, to answer you sure. He is my father that was nearest my mother when I was gotten. And him I think to be Sir Robert Falconbridge. Essex, for fashion's sake, demand again. And so an end to this contention. Was ever my man thus wronged as Robert is? Philip, speak, I say, who was thy father? Young man, how now? What art thou in a trance? Philip, awake! The man is in a dream. Philippus atavis edite regibus. What? Sayest thou Philip sprung of ancient kings? Quome repat tempestas? What wind of honour blows this fury forth, or whence proceed these fumes of majesty? Methinks I hear a hollow echo sound that Philip is the son unto a king. The whistling leaves upon the trembling trees whistle in concert that I am Richard's son. The bubbling murmur of the water's fall records Philippus Regius Filius. Birds in their flight make music with their wings filling the air with glory of my birth. Birds? Bubbles, leaves, and mountains echo, all ringing mine ears that I am Richard's son. Eee, fond man, when art thou carried? How are thy thoughts here wrapped in honour's heaven? Forget for what thou art and whence thou camest. Thy the father's land cannot maintain these thoughts. These thoughts are far unfitting falcon bridge. Well, they may, for why this mounting mind doth soar too high to stoop to Falcon Bridge. Oh, oh no. Knowest where thou art? Knowest thou who expects thine answer here? Wilt thou, upon a frantic madding vein, go lose thy land and state thyself base born? Yeah. Keep thy land! Richard, were thy sire, whate'er thou thinkst, say thou art Falconbridge. Speak, man, be sudden, who thy father was. Please it's your majesty, Sir Robert. <laughs> Philip, thou Falconbridge, cleave to thy jaws, it will not out. <clears throat> I cannot for my life say I am son unto a Falconbridge. <laughs> Let land and living go. It is honour's fire that makes me swear King Richard was my sire. Whatever thou thinks, say thou at Falcon Bridge. Oops, sorry, skipped. Uh, base to a king, I think. Base to a king. That's title of more state than knights begotten, though legitimate. Please it, your grace. I am King Richard's son. Robert, revive thy heart, let sorrow die. His faltering tongue not suffers him to lie. What headstrong fury doth enchant my son? Philip cannot repent. He hath done. Then, Philip, blame not me. Thyself hast lost by willfulness thy living and thy land. Robert, thou art the heir of Falconbridge. God give thee joy greater than thy desert. Why? How now, Philip? Give away thine own? Madam, I am bold to make myself your nephew, the poorest kinsman that your highness hath, and with this proverb, kin the world anew. Help hands, I have no lands. Honour is my desire. Let Philip live to show himself worthy, so great a sire. Philip, I think thou knewest thy grandam's mind, but cheer thee, boy. 
I will not see thee want. As long as Eleanor hath foot of land, henceforth thou shalt be taken for my son, and wait on me, and on thine uncle here, who shall give honour to thy noble mind. Philip, kneel down, that thou mayst thoroughly know how much uh, thy resolution pleaseth us. And draws his sword and lays it on Philip. Rise up, Sir Richard Plantagenet, King Richard's son. Grant heavens that Philip once may show himself worthy the honour of Plantagenet, who basest glory of a bastard's name. Now, gentlemen, we will away to France to check the pride of Arthur and his mates. Essex, thou shalt be ruler of my realm, and toward the main charges of my wars, I'll seize the lazy abbey lubber's lands into my hands to pay my men of war. The Pope and popelings shall not grease themselves with gold and groats that are the soldiers due. Thus, forward, lords, let us command, let our command be done, and march we forward mightily to France. And the king exits. It's not the end of the scene. Some people are left behind, but on that one, I say wonderful, on that note of sudden anti-Catholic um, uh, forward thinking there, um, let's on our way to pay for our France, let's just dissolve a few abbeys. That'd be great. Um, let's nick some, nick some odds and ends. Uh, the bastard, doesn't he have some fabulous speeches? Um, I really love that whole, everybody has to wait for him to do his long speech to the audience. Uh, you know, modern day, big spotlight, that's fine. I, I, I really am interested about how that moment would be navigated then. Um, it's really, it, it's really interesting. Um, all the kneeling that happened earlier, also just reminding me of another Queen's Men play with lots of kneeling. Um, but a, a, a sort of this, these, these, these moments like that, I'm, I'm just really interested in. But yeah, the, the, the really, really thinking about um, making his choice. And again, choices is something we have in another Queen's Men play, uh, True Tragedy of Richard III, where you, know, you make a decision about what you're going to do next and there's 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 some really good stuff um thoughts from the room who wants to leap in first uh, sarah i love the way that everyone ignores the one person who could actually settle this like you know lady falconbridge is there she could actually you know but no <laughs> why, mm. why listen to her she's only a woman she probably can't even read Mm. Uh, Lois. And I think the, the reason that they don't ask her is that she's already said that uh, yeah. she finds this whole thing so depressing and humiliating and <clears throat> she'd really like to leave, in fact. Yeah, and she did say my husband was, was Phillips. Yeah, no, this is the thing. She does, she does say and then everyone just ignores her. It's mm. like... Yeah, Explain she might this dark enigma. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, she just did. Mm. Uh, other thoughts, Alan? Uh, one thing I found interesting was that the initial speeches from the bastard um, were not in verse form in contrast to Robert's opening speeches. Mm. <clears throat> but when he suddenly gets the idea that he might actually be royal, uh, suddenly the verse forms match. Now, whether that's an artifact in the printing or in the editing, I'm not sure. Mm hmm. Uh, yes. Uh, additional thoughts, follow on thoughts. Um, as Stephen first. Uh, it's, it's just mad tonally. Um, it's really difficult to make a decision how to take it if you don't know the play, whether to do it straight because this is quite serious stuff about birthright and inheritance and, you know, link to the royal family or whether, whether to try and play it for some kind of comic turn. You know that he's there's this strange sort of altered altered state he's in where the you know the trees are talking to him the birds are talking to him the, the stones the mountains everything's talking to him well how do you play that mm. you know um, you, you either do it like he's completely off his box or or that he's disoriented and scared but that doesn't neither of those actually work if you do them like that all the way through it's, it's just really hard to, to find an appropriate, especially as everything else stops, screeches to a halt. 
for about mm. three minutes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's such an interesting piece of dramaturgy that, you know, an open shared light source play would do. Uh, you know, what is everybody else doing? See, lots of hands. I'll start with Alexandra. I I was wondering about that exact same thing. So that's why I wanted to come in on that because, it, you know, the, the fact that I feel it in my fingers, I feel it in my toes is not really sort of, you know, demonstrable proof, but everybody takes that over what the only person who wouldn't know what actually happened, who was right there, says. Um, but again, in yeah, I don't know how they would have done it at the time. I think it might have been a, a strange and interesting and maybe not terribly effective, maybe terribly effective device. But in modern times, we've got all these things that we can relate it to in a filmic way um, that I wonder how that would be done on stage without the sort of, um, uh, with, without a, something indicative of filmic qualities. So everybody starts going in slow motion and there's a spotlight on our hero as he speaks because we're inside his head, feels very trite. So I'd be curious uh, to know how, how that would work, how you'd make that work in a way that, because I think it would be brilliant for it to be divine inspiration, for us to perceive it as such. I, I think there's something interesting here, you know, you're talking about how difficult it is to play. I mean, I, I think that there is a, a sense that there's a lot at stake for him at this moment. So I don't know if, if it's uh, how far it goes, but, you know, just that sense of the heartbeat going on in the background as he sort of slightly panics, perhaps, um, but pulls himself uh, together. Uh, uh, Aliki, um, thoughts? I mean, I would be inclined to play it as, as metaphor, really. Not that he really thinks things are speaking to him but as a kind of melodramatic self-conception, everything in the universe cries out, I must be royal. Kind of thing. <laughs> uh, Sarah, I saw a hand. You see, I would be tempted to do it the exact opposite way, but this is the joy. This is the joy of these, <laughs> these speeches, like that you can do them anyway. It, it, his speech reminded me, um, it's not really relevant because it's modern, but um, there's a line in one of my favorite contemporary novels, the sky spoke to me. And it's like, I, uh, I could totally see this as a vision. It's almost like a, you know, a, a, a religious moment where I, I think he could play it as inspired, you could play it as inspired. You know, he's just inspired. It's like he's, he's gripped in that moment and literally everything starts in his head, starts telling him and, 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 and that, you know, he is, he is the, he is the son of Richard. And, I think that would be mesmerizing if he if he if he is the character genuinely believes it and, and is having this moment of inspiration. I, I think that could be really really gripping. Uh, Stephen, a last thought before we move forward. Uh, business, physicality. I think you know that if it's if it's played by somebody who's used to clown parts, then they're not just going to stand there and rate. Mm. They're going to be you know walking around the stage and listening to things. Mm. Uh, Lois, did I just see a hand uh, uh, briefly? Well, yeah, I mean, the, this this play and an awful lot of other plays given at this period where there's so much about who is the rightful king. And uh, what strikes me as really interesting is that the author is obviously not in very interested in the, <clears throat> the question that comes up right at the beginning, who is the rightful king of England, Arthur or John? That, I mean, that's dealt with incredibly briefly. And then we spend ages on this question of who is the rightful heir of Falconbridge. Uh, and uh, that's dwelt on and uh, given this poetic treatment and so on. But it's basically the same question, who, who is the rightful heir? Mm, yes, and it's it. I, I really like that. It, uh, I think Aliki uh, mentioned that in the chat as well. Oh, look here, another air comes. Um, it, you know, it's uh, it, it's playing with the idea in different ways. And I think that uh, the point that's 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 really strong. And I think that's the question that um, the other question we were talking about. You know, uh, why didn't anyone talk to uh, Lady Falconbridge? Well, uh, Lady Falconbridge does at least get some follow on now. Um, we do get a, a right of reply, if not in front of the king. So all the others, because the scene isn't over yet, massive scene. Um, go, uh, so, but it essentially comes in three parts. So uh, scene one uh, C, uh, if you want to think of it that way, exit the king and all the supernumeraries, but uh, Philip the Bastard is left with his mother. <coughs> Madam, I beseech you, deign me so much leisure as the hearing of a matter that I long to impart to you. 
What's the matter, Philip? I think your suit in secret tends to some money matter, which you suppose burns in the bottom of my chest? Well, no, madam, no, it's no such suit as to beg or borrow. Such a suit as might some other grant, I would not now have troubled you with all. Oh, God's name, let us hear it. Well, then, madam, thus, your ladyship sees well how that my scandal grows by means of you. In that report, as rumoured up and down, I am a bastard and no Falconbridge. This gross attempt, so tilted in my thoughts, maintaining combat to abridge my ease, that field and town and company alone, whatso I do or whereso I am, I cannot chase the slander from my thoughts. If it be true, resolve me of my sire. For pardon, madam, if I think amiss, be Philip Philip, and no Falconbridge, his father doubtless was as brave a man. To you, on these, as sometime Fireton, mistrusting silly Mirrup for his sire, staining a little bashful modesty, I beg some instance whence I am extraught. Yet more ado to haste me to my grave, and wilt thou too become a mother's cross? Must I accuse myself to close with you, slander myself to quiet your effects? And moves me, Philip, with this idle talk, which I remit in hope this mood will die. Uh, nay, lady mother, hear me further yet, for strong conceit drives duty hence a while. Your husband, Falconbridge, was father to that son that carries marks of nature like the sire. The son that blotteth you with wedlock's breach and holds my right is lineal in descent from him whose form was figured in his face. Well, can nature so dissemble in her frame to make the one so like as like may be, and any other print no character to challenge any mark of true descent? Well, my brother's mind is base and too, too dull to mount where Philip lodgeth his effects. His external graces that you view, though I report it, counterpoise not mine. His constitution, plain debility, requires the chair, mine, the seat of steel. And what is he? And what am I to him? When anyone that knoweth how to cart will scarcely judge us both one country born. This, madam, this hath drove me from myself. And here, by heaven's eternal lamps, I swear, as cursed Nero with his mother did, so I with you, you resolve me not. Let mother's tears quench out thy anger's fire, and urge no further what thou dost require. Let son's entreaty sway the mother now, or else she dies. I'll not infringe my vow. Unhappy task, must I recount my shame? Blab my misdeeds, or, or by concealing die. Some power strike me speechless for a time, or take from him a while his hearing's use. I wish I so unhappy as I am. The fault is mine, and he the faulty fruit. I blush, I faint. Oh, would I might be mute. Mother, be brief. I long to know my name. And longing die to shroud thy mother's shame. Oh, madam, come, you need not be so loth. The shame is shared equal twixt us both. It's not a slackness in me worthy blame to be so old and cannot write my name. Mother, resolve me. And Philip, hear thy fortune and my grief. My honour's lost by purchase of thyself. My shame, my name, and husband's secret wrong, all maimed and stained. A youth's unruly sway, and when thou knowest from whence thou art extraught, if thou knewst what suits, what threats, what fears, to move by love or massacre by death, to yield with love or end by love's contempt, the mightiness of him that courted me, who tempered terror with his wanton talk, talk that something may extenuate the guilt. But let it not advantage me so much. Upbraid me rather with the Roman dame that shed her blood to wash away her shame. Why stand I to expostulate the crime with pro and 
contra. Now the deed is done. When, to conclude, two words may tell the tale. That Philip's father was a prince's son, rich England's rule, world's only terror, he, for honor's loss, left me with child of thee, whose son thou art, and pardon me the rather, for fair King Richard was thy noble father. Oh, Robin Falconbridge, I wish thee joy, my sire a king, and I a landless boy, God's lady mother. The world is in my debt. There's something owing to Plantagenet. Nay, marry, sir, let me alone for game. I'll act some wonders now I know my name. My blessed Mary, I'll not sell that pride for England's wealth and all the world beside. Sit fast, the proudest of my father's foes. Away, good mother. There the comfort goes. And they exit and the first scene ends. All sorts going on there. Um, some of it, uh, I mean, the, the, I've got to say that the, the quality of the dialogue is, is, is incredibly strong throughout all of this. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, Lady Falconbridge gets her own aside moment to the audience. <laughs> I've, I've written in the scene, they're all at it. Um, <laughs> here, um, it's 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 but it's weirdly coercive and there's there's all sorts of weird elements to this because mm. of course he, now that he knows he knows what's at stake here and she knows what's at stake here because they know they're going to be get something out of being a royal bastard which they didn't earlier um there's a, an interesting question about you know what is true and what is not potentially in this scene uh you know um is 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 this uh you know trying to decide uh is is the shame worth it for social advancement um and all sorts of questions that's going on here and the way shame is played uh the nature of richard's uh love to lady falconbridge uh, seems a bit dodgy in places um he said uh putting it mildly uh so uh question uh, thoughts around the room lois first Oh, well, uh, I think it's pretty shocking that he threatens to murder her if she doesn't tell yeah. him. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's what loses all the sympathy that one has been building up for him in this scene. Mm. Uh, Eric, were you saying something? No, I was just saying like, yeah, he, he loves her so much. Yeah. He loves her so much that he'll murder her. Um, <laughs> yeah. mm. uh, Stephen? It's a way of preserving her virtue, though, isn't it? Mm. Which he won't tell unless under extreme duress. It's, it's kind of it's it's a different standard applied to a woman, isn't it? Mm. So it's it's okay for him to be kind of Jack the Lad and I, you know, I'm I'm free, but when it comes down to um, you know what my mum got up to, or what everybody's going to think of her, you know this is another layer to why she's been keeping stomach court, and why this has to happen in private. It's to do with you know uh, women's honour, mm. and hence the reference to Lucrece. You know, I mm. think it's a reference to Lucrece. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lynn. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if I, I think um, Stephen's rather somewhat positive spin on this is, is, is persuading me. Um, because not only is Lady Falcon, does Philip, her son, threaten her with murder if she doesn't, um, if she, doesn't tell him the truth. It's sort of a, that's a rehearsal of um, King Richard who to move by love or massacre by death to yield with love or end by love's contempt. Evidently, Richard threatened her with violence if she didn't, didn't um, succumb. And, and that reference to, to Lucrece implies that she didn't, she wasn't seduced, she was raped. Mm. Mm. And her fault is is that she didn't commit suicide afterwards. Mm. Uh, it's all taking a, taken very much a dark turn in this scene. Yeah. Um, other thoughts in the room? Well, also wouldn't have like back then historically. I'm not entirely sure about the historical context, but surely there would have been like this kind of level of it's very important to know who is the rightful king or queen, especially like when. We have King James of Scotland, King, and all that stuff going on. I, I don't know entirely, you know, the historical background there, but yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, the, 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 this whole opening scene is throwing these questions about, you know, who is rightful to, be, you know, who are the rightful heirs to various things? Um, and it's, it's demonstrating a whole series of, uh, of muddiness in the water. The, wa the waters are very unclear as to, you know, who really has the rights to anything. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, and I, I'd really like to see this scene play with the darkness that's in it. Like, I, I, I would actually be interested in seeing this where you know he gets his sword out and he's got her on his knees and he's holding his sword up to her throat and saying you know tell me um because there is something really disturbing about it and i think you could pull all of that out um on stage mm. it's very much a scene with a scene with three scenes doing tonally very different things mm. um you know he's ringing the changes again um if we're going with peel uh, you know, it fits fits very much some of the things these uh, appeals done elsewhere. So, um, uh, uh, final thoughts before we move on to scene two. I I'm just stuck on that rape. Um, I I can't move away from it. That, that's the bit I want undermined as well as the the violence from her son. That's all. Mm, yes, I mean you put on the in the chat, and I've I've got it underlined as well. Who te Richard, who tempered terror with his wanton talk? Um, you know, it's it's pretty explicit, and it's said more than once uh, in varying ways. Yeah, that's Harvey Weinstein stuff there. <laughs> Not nice how we're used to seeing Richard the Lionheart. <laughs> hmm. Also, the fact that sorry. No, no, Garrick. I was just going to say also the fact that kings could get away with it or like someone in power could get away with it. Whereas now, well, I guess they can still get away with it if it's not spoken out loud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alexandra, were you uh, wanting to leap in? Uh, yes, I, besides the fact that, that it, what, what we're pointing out right now is really good contemporary references that would make this a very good play to put on now. Um, <laughs> In that awkward, <laughs> uncomfortable kind of way, yes, um, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah, and in the way of, well, look, nothing changes or, or things don't change as much as we think they do because the, you know, the internal workings of the human mind have not altered over the last... Um, thousand years or indeed longer um the one interesting thing that i found as well as uh the the question of who is the rightful heir within the two sections of the story mm -hmm. is that they cross over in a very interesting way uh whereby because he is a bastard of richard's um philip gets renamed richard and welcomed whereas the rightful son of Jeffreys is mm. being alienated and treated as as um, a problem that needs dealing with, and I, I found that very interesting. Well, he's a snitch, isn't he? You're supposed to keep quiet about these things, um, mm. and you know there he's he's gone in I, uh, uh, to to undermine a member of his own family, or two members of his own family. I mean. He's 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 not a desperately nice person in in respect of that that scene either, mm. Sarah. There's that delicious irony as well because um, John says early on, well, he's the eldest son. Mm. You know, he's the one with the he uh, yeah he might be a bastard, but he's the one with the claim to the title and the mm. money. And then of course, as it turns out, he's got that he's got a claim to his title and money. So, I mean, that's just a really great bit of, yeah, yeah. He has a sort of divine hotline to confirm it all for us, though, doesn't he? Mm. So that, that's the thing, you know, we, we do go to the kind of court of appeal, you know, the, the natural world says, no, actually, forget about this, this is actually the truth. Whereas in the, in, the, in the world of high politics, it's just claim and counterclaim. Mm. Okay, we're going to go on to uh, scene two. Uh, we're, we're running a little behind because there's been so much to say, which is fine. Uh, we can do less today if necessary, so that's uh, that's not a problem. We've got slack in the system further down the line. Scene two, I'm going to read in Arthur because uh, we're, we're slightly shorter than intended today. Uh, but we have, we're going over to the, the French. Enter Philip the French King, uh, Louis uh, Limoges, uh, Constance and her son, Arthur. Now, didn't we broach the title of thy claim? 
young Arthur in the Albion territory scaring proud Angier with a pu puissant siege. Brave Austria, cause of Coeur de Lyon's death, is also come to aid thee in thy wars. And all our forces join for Arthur's right, and but for causes of great consequence. Pleading delay till news from England come, twice should not Titan hide him in the west to cool the fetlocks of his weary team, till I had with an unresisted shock controlled the manage of proud Angier's walls, or made a forfeit of my claim to chance. Maybe that John, in conscience or in fear to offer wrong where you impugn the ill, will send such calm conditions back to France as shall rebate the edge of fearful wars. If so, forbearance is a deed well done. Ah, mother, possession of a crown is much, and John, as I have heard reported of for present vantage, would adventure far. The world can witness in his brother's time he took upon him rule and almost reign. Then must it follow, as a doubtful point, that he'll resign the rule unto his nephew? I rather think the menace of the world sounds in his ears as threats of no esteem, and sooner would he scorn Europa's power than lose the smallest title he enjoys, for questionless he is an Englishman. Why, are the English peerless in compare? Brave cavaliers, as e'er that island bred, have lived and died and dared and done enough, yet never graced their country for the cause. England is England, yielding good and bad, and John of England is as other Johns. Trust me, young Arthur, if thou like my reed, praise thou the French that helped thee in th this need. The Englishman hath little cause, I trow, to spend good speeches on so proud a foe. Why, Arthur, here's his spoil, but now is gone, who, when he lived, outroved his brother John. But hasty curs that lie so long to catch come halting home and meet their overmatch. Good news comes now. Here's the ambassador. For enter Chatillon. And in good time, welcome, my lord Chatillon. What news will John accord to our command? Uh, be I not brief to tell your highness all, he will approach to interrupt my tale, for one self-bottom brought us both to France. He, on his part, will try the chance of war, and if his words infer assured truth, will lose himself and all his followers, ere yield unto the least of your demands. The mother queen, she taketh on a main against Lady Constance, counting her the cause that doth effect this claim to Albion, conjuring Arthur with a grand dame's care to leave his mother, willing him submit his state to John and her protection, who, as she saith, are studious, studious for his good. Uh, more circumstance, the season interrupts. This is the sum which briefly I have shown. This bitter wind must nip somebody's spring. Sudden and brief white, so tis harvest weather. But say, Chatillon, what persons of account are with him? Of England, Earl Pembroke and Salisbury, uh, the only noted men of any name. Next them, a bastard of the king's deceased, a hardy wild head, tough and venturous, with many other men of high resolve. Uh, then is there with them Eleanor, mother queen, and Blanche, her niece, a daughter to the king of Spain. These are the prime birds of this hot adventure. And so having called out who has to enter now into this scene, into the wing very, very loudly uh, in the previous speech, well done there, uh, Chatillon. Um, enter indeed King John and his followers, Queen Eleanor, Bastard, Blanche, Falkenbridge, Earls, etc. Meseemeth, John, an over-daring spirit effects some frenzy in thy rash approach, treading my confines with thy armed troops. I rather looked for some submiss reply touching the claim thy nephew Arthur makes to that which thou unjustly dost usurp. For that, Chatillon can discharge you all. I list not plead my title with my tongue, nor came I hither with intent of wrong to France or thee, or any right of thine, but in defence and purchase of my right, the town of Angers, 
which thou dost begirt in the behalf of Lady Constance's son, whereto nor he nor she can lay just claim. Yes, false intruder, if that be just and headstrong usurpation put apart, Arthur, my son, heir to thy elder brother, without ambiguous shadow of descent, is sovereign to the substance thou withholdest. Misgoverned gossip, stain to this resort, occasion of these undecided jars. I say that no, to check thy vain suppose, thy son hath naught to do with that he claims. For proofs whereof I can infer a will that bars the way he urgeth by descent. A will indeed, a crabbed woman's will, wherein the devil is an overseer and proud Dame Eleanor's sole executress. More wills than so on peril of my soul were never made to hinder Arthur's right. But say there was, as sure there can be none, the law intends such testaments as void, where right dissent can no way be impeached. Peace, Arthur, peace. Thy mother makes thee wings to soar with peril after Icarus. <laughs> and trust me, youngling, for thy father's sake I pity much the hazard of thy youth. Beshrew you else, how pitiful you are, ready to weep to hear him ask his own. Sorrow betide such grandams and such grief that minister a poison of pure love. But who so blind as cannot see this beam that you, forsooth, would keep your cousin down for fear his mother should be used too well? And there's the grief. Confusion catch the brain that hammers just to stop a prince's reign. Impatient, frantic. Common slanderer, immodest damn, unnurtured quarreller. I tell thee, I, not envy to thy son, but justice makes me speak as I have done. But here's no proof that shows your son a king. What once my sword shall more at large set down. That may break before the truth be known. This may hold till all is right be shown. I beg your pardon. Good word, Sir Sauce. Your betters are in place. <laughs> Not you, Sir Doughty, with your lion's case. Ah, uh, joy betide his soul to whom that spoil belonged. Ah, uh, Richard, how thy glory here is wronged. Methinks that Richard's pride and Richard's fall should be a precedent to fright you all. What words are these? How do my sinews shake my father's foe clad in my father's spoil? A thousand furies kindle with revenge this heart, but collar keeps a consistory searing my inwards with a brand of hate. How doth a lecto whisper in mine ears, delay not Philip, kill the villain straight, disrobe him of the matchless monument thy father's triumph over the savages. Base herd groom, coward, peasant, worse than a threshing slave. What makes thou with the trophy of a king? Shamest thou not, coistrel, loathsome dunghill swad, to grace thy carcass with an ornament too precious for a monarch's coverture? Scarce can I temper due obedience unto the presence of my sovereign from acting outrage on this trunk of hate. But arm thee, traitor, wronger of renown, for by his soul I swear, my father's soul, twice will I not review the morning's rise till I have torn that trophy from my back and split thy heart for wearing it so long. Philip has sworn. If it be not done, let not the world repute me, Richard's son. Nay, soft, sir bastard, hearts are not split so soon. Let me rejoice that at the end do win, and take this lesson at thy foeman's hand. Pawn not thy life to get thy father's skin. Well may the world speak of his knightly valor that wins this hide to wear a lady's favor. May I thrive, and nothing brook with me, if shortly I present it not to thee. 
Wordings forbear, for time is coming fast, that deeds may try what words cannot determine, and to the purpose for the cause you come. Meseems you set right in chance of war, yielding no other reasons for your claim. But so and so, because it shall be so. No, so wrong shall be suborned by trust of strength, a tyrant's practice to invest himself, where weak resistance giveth wrong the way. The check the, to, to check the witch in holy lawful arms, I, in the right of Arthur, Geoffrey's son, am come before this city of Angier to bar all other false supposed claim from whence or howsoever the error springs. And in this quarrel on my princely word, I'll fight it out unto the latest man. No, King of France, I will not be commanded by any power or prince in Christendom to yield an instance how I hold mine own, more than to answer that mine own is mine. But wilt thou see me parley with the town and hear them offer me allegiance, fealty and homage as true liegemen ought? Summon them. Summon them. I will not believe it till I see it. And when I see it, I'll soon change it. So they summon the town, I don't know if it's by trumpet or something along those lines, and the citizens appear upon the walls. You men of Angiers, and as I take it, my loyal subjects, I have, I have summoned you to the walls to dispute on my right, where to think you doubtful therein, which I am persuaded you are not. In few words, our brother's son, backed with the King of France, have beleaguered your town upon a false pretended title to the same. In defense whereof I, your liege lord, have brought our power to fence you from the usurper, to free your intended servitude, and utterly to supplant the foeman to my right and your rest. Say then who, who keep you the town for? For our lawful king. I was no less persuaded. Then in God's name, open your gates and let me enter. And please your highness, we control not your title. Neither will we readily, rashly admit your entrance. If you be lawful king, with all obedience, we keep it to your use. If not king, our rashness were to be impeached for yielding without more considerate trial. We answer not as men lawless, but to the behoof of him that proves lawful. I shall not come in then? <laughs> no, my lord, till we know more. Then hear me speak in the behalf of Arthur, son of Geoffrey, elder brother to John. His title manifests without contradiction to the crown and kingdom of England, with Angier and diverse towns on this side the sea. Will you acknowledge him, your liege lord, who speaketh in my word, to entertain you with all favours, as beseemeth a king to his subjects, or a friend to his well-willers, or stand you to the peril of your contempt when his title is proved by the sword? We answer as before, till you have proved one right, we acknowledge none right. He that tries himself our sovereign, to him will we remain firm subjects, and for him, and in his right, we hold our town, as desirous to know the truth, as loath to subscribe before we know. More than this we cannot say, and more than this we dare not do. Then, John, I defy thee in the name and behalf of Arthur Plantagenet, thy king and cousin, whose right and patrimony thou detainest, as I doubt not, ere the day end in a set battle, make thee confess, whereunto a zeal to write, I challenge thee. I accept the challenge and turn the defiance to thy throat. And they exit for some fighty-fighty action. Um, so, um... Lots of the I like the first citizen. I think the citizens of this town are very, very sensible people. I think this is this, you know, it's it's really not our problem which of you's king. Just sort it out amongst yourselves. Uh, the, then we've got the mother rap battle uh going on uh, at one point. My son's uh no, my son, um um shush small child um <laughs> moments. Um yeah, there's so so much good stuff and so many good insults, as has um, I love Arthur's line. For questionless, he is an Englishman. 
Um, says Horrible. says so much. Says so much. There are other good insults that I think uh, people should uh, bring up as they we go around the room. Uh, so thoughts from this scene again. It contains multitudes, but uh, it's not not a long scene in, in the way we had before. Who wants to dive in first? Uh, Leaky. I mean, it's another iteration of the same dilemma we've had at every point, right? Who's the legitimate person? Who gets to do this thing? Tell us. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, a, it's, 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 it's really playing with this iteration of, of right. Uh, you know, who's the rightful king? Well, it's not really who's, who's got the most power <laughs> is really what we're talking about here. Stephen. Well, yeah, it's not rightful. It's right, isn't it? Mm. And that, that, that's one of the things that the, the previous scene is, is functioning with. Is, is to kind of just throw this sort of narrow legalistic approach up in the air. Mm. Um, other thoughts? Uh, Lois? Yeah, well, I love this little hint of a, a great romantic thing going between Blanche and the bastard. I mean, there are only a couple of lines to indicate it, but it's quite exciting. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, other thoughts um, or expansions? Um, suddenly, everyone's gone quiet. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, uh, the the back and forth, you know, Queen Eleanor and uh, and Constance. There's there's, there's you know, it, it, it's, it is it is very entertainingly written. I have to say, uh, <laughs> it is it's very nicely put. Uh, Alexandra, I saw I saw a hand. Yes, it, it, I, I agree. It's entertaining and concise in, in moving things forward. Um, and I, there's something that is not sort of um, emphasized by the text. It's our reading of it where we notice this endemic hypocrisy um, that I find very exciting in, as a thought in, in putting it on nowadays, you know, again. Um, the the idea that y that we would I mean it, I don't know how exactly but to illustrate the fact that exactly the same people are saying that these are the rules in the, in a particular situation and that these are the same things are not the rules <laughs> in the yeah other situation I just I can see it and I love it and I don't know how to um, present that in a way that makes it sort of evident and clear without it being and history lesson ladies and gentlemen we interrupt this program <laughs> to teach you about um but i think it's it's one of the great exciting things about this <coughs> so much as we've read so far yeah um i mean it's doing a lot and it's throwing a lot of things at us um and it is going to be a question of how much you know the audience takes in um but then it's also a matter of do does the audience necessarily have to take everything in as long as it takes and nothing that its interest is held? Alan? Yeah, I must admit, the only sensible character I think we've got so far is First Citizen. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you can't, of course, put anything on stage that actually gives the people a vote. You know, it's got to be run for on behalf of the Aristos, yeah. as per ever. Um, yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't be the first time one of the best uh, parts in a sequence uh, in a Queen's Men's play has the, the most boring name. Um, we've had Messenger and Messenger. Page before who've turned yeah. out to be delightful. Um, and yeah, Citizen here. I don't think the Citizen lasts as long um, as those two uh, do, but um, there's, there's lots of good things there. Uh, any uh, final thoughts? What we're going to do is we're going to run scene three, which is very short, into scene four. Uh, and we're going to try and get through them before we uh, crash into extra time. Uh, if it looks like we're really going to fail, I'll pause midway through the scene and we'll just, uh, we'll, we're at a, a logical point. As scene four is reasonably long, but not excessively long, he said, famous last words. So scene three, there are excursions. There may even be alarms as well. Who knows? The bastard Chasif Limoges, uh, the ostrich duke, and maketh him leave the lion's skin. Now thou gone, misfortune on thy steps. Chill cold fear assail thy time and the rest. Morpheus, be there thy silent even cave, besieges thoughts with dismal fantasies. The ghastly objects of pale threatening moors affright him every minute with stern looks. 
Let shadow temper terror in his thoughts and let the terror make the coward mad. And in his madness, let him fear pursuit. And so in frenzy, let the peasant die. And he takes up the lion's skin or something similar at this point. Here is the ransom that allays this rage. The first creole that Richard left his son, with which I shall surprise his living foes, as Hector's statue did the fainting Greeks. And exit the bastard. That's been the battle, ladies and gentlemen. Scene four, enter the king's heralds with trumpets to the walls of Angiers, Anger, Agir, Agir. It's It does get spelt variously throughout. They summon the town. On by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Anjou, Touraine, etc., 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 demandeth once again of you, his subjects of Angier, if you will quietly surrender up the town into his hands. Philippe, by the grace of God, King of France, demandeth in the hundred, on the behalf of Arthur, Duke of Britannia, if you will surrender up the town into his hands to the use of the said Arthur. Citizens, plural. Alan, if you'll step in and be all the citizens. Sorry, well. I, ah, sorry, I lost the page. Heralds, go tell the two victorious princes that we, the poor inhabitants of Angier, require a parley of their majesties. We go. We go. And <laughs> so enter the king's queen, Eleanor Blanche Bastard, Falconbridge, Luminaires, uh, Louis... Chatillon, the Earls of Pembroke, Salisbury, Constance, and Arthur, Duke of Britannia. Uh, there will be some um, uh, doubling uh, issues occasionally here. Uh, good luck, everyone. Herald, what answer do the townsmen send? Will Angier yield to Philip of France? The townsmen on the walls accept your grace. And a parley, a crave a parley of your majesty. You citizens of Angiers, have your eyes beheld the slaughter that our English foes have made upon the coward, fraudful French, and have you wisely pondered therewithal your gain in yielding to the English king? Their loss in yielding to the English king. But John, they saw from out their highest towers the chevaliers of France and crossbow shot, make lanes of slaughtered bodies through thine host, and are resolved to yield to Arthur's right. Why, Philip, though thou bravest it for the walls, thy conscience knows that John hath won the field. Whatever my conscience knows, thy army feels that Philip had the better of the day. Philip! Indeed, that's not my line. Indeed, hath got the lion's case, which here he holds the Limoges disgrace, base duke, to fly and leave such spoils behind. For this thou knewest the force to make me stay. It fared with thee as with the mariner, spying the huge whale, whose monstrous bulk doth bear the waves like mountains for the wind, that throws out empty vessels so to stay his fury, while the ship will sail away. Philip. Is thine, and for this princely presence, madam, I humbly lay it at your feet, being the first adventure I achieved, the first exploit your grace did me enjoin. Many more I long to be enjoined. Philip, I take it, and I thee command to wear the same as erst thy father did. Therewith receive this favour at my hands to encourage thee to follow Richard's fame. Ye citizens of Angers, are you mute? Arthur or John, say, which shall be your king? We care not which, if once we knew the right. Until we know, we will not yield our right. Uh, might Philip counsel to so mighty kings, as are the kings of England and of France? He would advise your graces to unite and knit your forces against these citizens pulling their battered walls about their ears. The town once won, then strive about the claim, for they are minded to delude you both. Kings, princes, lords, and knights, assembled here, the citizens of Angers, all by me, entreat your majesty to hear them speak, 
and as you like the motion they shall make, so to account and follow their advice. Speak on. Speak on. We give, we thee, give leave. thee leave. Then thus, whereas that young and lusty knight incites you on to knit your kingly strengths, the motion cannot choose but please the good, and such as love the quiet of the state. But how, my lords, should your strengths be knit? Not to oppress your subjects and your friends, and fill the world with brawls and mutinies, but unto peace your forces should be knit, to live in princely league and amity. Do this, the gates of Angers shall give way, and stand wide open to your heart's content, to make this peace a lasting bond of love. Remains one only honourable means, which by your pardon I shall here display. Louis, the Dauphin, and the heir of France, a man of noted valour through the world, is yet unmarried. Let him take to wife the beauteous daughter of the King of Spain, niece to King John, the lovely Lady Blanche, begotten on his sister Eleanor, with her in marriage will her uncle give, castles and towers as fittest such a match. The kings thus joined in league of perfect love, they may so deal with Arthur, Duke of Bretagne, who is but young and yet unmeet to reign, as he shall stand contented every way. Thus have I boldly, for the common good, delivered what the city gave in charge, and as upon conditions you agree, so shall we stand content to yield the town. A proper peace, if such a motion hold. These kings bear arms for me and for my right, and they shall share my lands to make them friends. Son John, follow this motion, as thou lovest thy mother. Make league with Philip, yield to anything. Lewis shall have my niece, and then be sure Arthur shall have small succour out of France. Brother of France, you hear the citizens, then tell me how you mean to deal herein. Why, John, what canst thou give unto thy niece that hast no foot of land but Arthur's right? Ah, oh, lady citizens, I like your choice. A lovely damsel is the Lady Blanche, worthy the heir of Europe for her fear. What, king? Why stand you gazing in a trance? Why, how now, lords? Accursed citizens, to fill and tickle their ambitious ears with hope of gain that springs from Arthur's loss, some dismal planet at thy birthday reign, for now I see the fall of all thy hopes. Lady and Duke of Bretagne, I know you, know you both. The King of France respects his honor more than to betray his friends and favorers. Princess of Spain, could you affect my son if we upon conditions could agree? Truth, madam, take an English gentleman. Slave as I was, I thought to have moved the match. Grandam, you made me half a promise once that Lady Blanche should bring me wealth enough and make me the heir of store of English land. Peace, Philip. I will look thee out a wife. We must with policy compound the strife. With Louis get her? Say no more. Let the frolic Frenchman take no scorn, if Philip front him with an English horn. Lady, what answer make you to the King of France? Can you affect the Dauphin for your lord? I thank the King that likes of me so well to make me bride unto so great a prince. Uh, but give me leave, my lord, to pause on this, uh, lest being too, too forward in the cause, it may be blemished to my modesty. <laughs> Son John, and worthy Philip, King of France, do you confer a while about the dower, and I will school my modest niece so well that she shall yield as soon as you have done. Ay, there's the wretch that broaches all this ill. Why fly I not upon that beldam's face, and with my nails pull forth her hateful eyes? Sweet mother, uh, cease these hasty madding fits. For my sake, let my grandam have her will. Oh, would she with her hands pull forth my heart, 
I could afford it to appease these broils. But mother, let us wisely wink at all, lest farther harms ensue our hasty speech. Brother of England, what dowry wilt thou give unto my son to, in marriage with thy niece? First, Philip, no, her dowry out of Spain to be so great as may content a king. But, more to mend and amplify it, the same, I give in money 30,000 marks. For land, I leave it to thine own demand. Then I demand Vaucasson, Touraine, Maine, Poitiers, and Anjou, these five provinces which thou, as King of England, holdst in France. Then shall our peace be soon concluded on. No less than five such provinces. At once! <laughs> Mother, what shall I do? My brother got these lands with much effusion of our English blood, and shall I give it all away at once? John, give it him, so shall thou live in peace. And keep the residue some jeopardy. Philip, bring forth thy son. Here is my niece, and here in marriage I do give with her from me and my successors, English kings, Vaucasson, Poitiers, Anjou, Touraine, Maine, and 30,000 marks of stipend coin. Now, citizens, how like you this match? Be joy to see so sweet a peace begun. And then, because of random doubling, Lewis speaks. Uh, so um, uh, it's the same person, but uh, continue, uh, Alan, as uh, Lewis again. Lewis with Blanche shall ever live content. But now, King John, what say you to the Duke? Father, speak as you may in his behalf. King John, be good unto thy nephew here, and give him somewhat that shall please thee best. Arthur, although thou troubles England's peace, yet uh, here I give thee Bretagne for thine own, <laughs> together with the earldom of Richmond, and this rich city of Angiers withal. And if thou seek to please thine uncle John, shalt see, my son, how I will make of thee. Now everything is sorted to this end, let's in. And there, prepare the marriage rites, which in St. Mary's Chapel presently shall be performed ere this presence part. And they all exit except for Constance and... Arthur. Madam, good cheer, these drooping languishments add no redress to salve our awkward haps. If heavens have concluded these events, to small avail is bitter pensiveness. Seasons will change, and so our present grief may change with them, and all to our relief. Ah, boy, thy years I see are far too green to look into the bottom of these cares. But I, who see the poise that weigheth down thy wheel, my wish, and all the willing means, wherewith my fortune and thy fame shall mount, what joy, what ease, what rest can lodge in me, with whom all hope and hap do disagree? Yet ladies' tears and cares and solemn shows, rather than helps, heap up more work for woes. If any power will hear a widow's plaint that from a wounded soul implores revenge, send fell contagion to infect this clime, this cursed country, where the traitors breathe, whose perjury, as proud Briarius, beleaguers all the sky with misbelief. He promised Arthur, and he swear it too, to fence thy right and check thy foeman's pride. Now, black-spotted perjurer as he is, he takes a truce with Eleanor's damned brat and marries Louis to her lovely niece, sharing thy fortune and thy birthday's gift between these lovers. I'll betide the match, and as they shoulder thee from out there thy own and triumph in a widow's tearful cares, so heaven crossed them with a thriftless course is all the, the bloody spilt on either part closing the crannies of the thirsty earth, grown to a love game and a bridal feast. And must thy birthright bid the wedding bands? 
poor helpless boy, hopeless and helpless too, to whom misfortune seems no yoke at all. Thy stay, thy state, thy imminent mishaps, woundeth thy mother's thoughts with feeling care. My looks thou pale, thy color flies thy face. I trouble now the fountain of thy youth and make it muddy with my doll's discourse. Go in with me, reply not, lovely boy. We must obscure this moan with melody, lest worser rack ensue our malcontent. And lo, they exit. Um, and yes, it's been commented in the chat um, uh, a few times, you know, that like the previous uh, long scene where, you know, you have various things battled out in public, you then get a couple of stragglers left behind to sort of bemoan their fate. And what's really interesting about this, about peace, uh, this as a piece of diplomacy uh, mm -hmm. that I find really interesting is just actually how it's falling apart while it's happening. Yeah. Everybody hates this compromise. Nobody is happy at all. Um, and for all sorts of different reasons. I love the bastard's reasons, um, in, in a sense. It's just he's going, well, I'm sure we'll cuckold him later. He'll be fine. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I'll find a way. Um, Arthur's response um, at one point, you no know, proper piece of such emotion hold. I, I started reading that thinking, oh, he's sort of in favour of it. And then I sort of got halfway through it, you know. No, no, he's just saying, fuck this for a game of soldiers, isn't he? Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, that, I, 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 I'll trim that out. Um, <laughs> Lois, stop me from speaking. It's obviously going wrong. Uh, no, I'm just puzzled about the very end of this scene. Uh, she tells him not to reply, and then she says, we must obscure this moan with melody, lest worse or rack ensue our malcontent. I mean, she may just mean we've got to start being polite now, but it sounded as if this was a cue for some sort of music. Uh, could be, um, or just, yeah, obscure this moment with something, isn't it? So we've got to make sure nobody notices. Yeah. Um, but in fact, she- Maybe it's laughter. Confused. You she know, doesn't moan into laughter. At all. She, she, you know, she never stops saying what a horrible thing this is. So it seems odd to, maybe, maybe that's what she intends to do, but it certainly isn't what she's going to do. Yeah, you know, ch changing, changing sounds of woe to laughter or just a little, ha ha ha, yes, everything will be fine. <sighs> False rictus grin gets put on. Um, it, it, it's uh, really, there are lots of people to say things. Alan first. Yeah, I think, I think basically you could um, scan the last two lines. Right now it's time just to be bloody devious. Mm. Um, but the other thought I had was the stage direction at the beginning of that, which was the Ostrich Duke, and that did remind me of Blackadder Goes Forth. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The, Do you uh, mean the Ostrich died in vain? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, because there's all this business with, the, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the lion skin or whatever that's dropped in that exchange that then is one of the gifts that gets passed over between them. Uh, mm. Or I'd say gifts, you know, thing, thing, thing exchanged. And, Luke um, Boogie. Yeah, and it's sort of it's sort of an odd little 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 moment. Um, I, I I do love the, the the citizens going right. We haven't really sorted it out, have you guys? And the bastard says, "Well, why don't we just both attack the town and just kill everyone? That be that'd be a fab plan, won't it?" And he says, "Ah, oh, we've got a compromise." I love them. Um, yeah, all sorts of things. I think it's really interesting about actually um, for a play of this time and by this company where we haven't been desperately impressed by a lot of the, uh, the parts for women is just how many parts of women there are in this play. And they all are talking a lot so far, um, you know, at the same time uh, in, you know, and sometimes they're listened to and sometimes they're not. But, you know, they they are doing things, um, which I find really, uh, really positive um not necessarily nice things but hey you can't have it all uh alexandra yeah i've, I've actually got an interesting thing that i've noticed on that because of the fact that we can see that there are women and they speak um the fact that we have a female character in blanche who doesn't um was something that i i found interesting um because i mean we'll see how much she speaks hereafter but in a scene where Eleanor and um, uh, Constance have the whole chunks of text, she gets a couple of lines of, you okay to get married? 
I guess. Okay, good. We're doing it. Um, so it really, that to me kind of uh, showed a, ver very, a variety in the balances of power, which um, we get also with the male characters, but generally with the female characters, you don't have as many exponents so that you can show them uh, with, with so many differences, if that's making sense. You generally, you know, you, you get the one woman and it's shut up woman, or you get, you know, a... Uh, uh, <laughs> wonderful characters that turn up for one scene, make magic happen, solve all the problems and then disappear, etc, etc, other options. Mm. But yeah, this was really nice to have a whole, a whole bunch of, of, um, of female characters who, who, you know, communicate and as you said, sometimes are even listened to. Mm. Eleanor. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I mean, this whole Blanche uh, bastard thing, it's, I mean, it's entirely fictitious anyway, but uh, it, it's, it is weird, isn't it? I mean, she does the whole knight and quest and here's your uh, reward thing, and then she's told to marry someone else, and then, then Eleanor just says, yes, I'll see to it. She will be quite happy to marry him. <laughs> That's the end of that. Yeah, that that was that that was a really. I mean, there's all sorts of really interesting lines of dialogue that just keep leaping out at you. Um, and I, uh, there there was a moment in the chat when Alan was saying because uh, we've had uh, Helen, uh, who's not in today, was talking about you know always Peel doing uh, sea metaphors and uh, similes and things, and uh, I was saying, well, I haven't had any yet. So, uh, and exactly the moment when <laughs> when someone <laughs> did an extended sea based <laughs> um, metaphor, and it was uh, it was um, you know a wonderful wonderful. Metaphor. Moment. Um, uh, other thoughts? I thought I saw Stephen. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite a relief to find a bit that you can actually just play for comedy. Um, the, this, the, the Angers wall scene reminded me nothing so much as an improv status game mm. where you, you, you go around whispering in people's ear and you've got two tens and, and maybe, maybe a, a six who thinks he's an eight or something. And it, it's just, it just plays it out to perfection. And it goes from a uh, sort of, you know, deeply rooted meditations on, on the body and inheritance to, to sort of faintly social embarrassment, these guys. You know, it, it, they, it kind of turns into a sort of, yes, minister or something. Um, but it doesn't stay with it for very long. You know, it, it is a kind of medley idea, isn't it? You get you know you can you can imagine it almost being improvised you know well i'm this kind of bit of a scene and we do that but we've got something completely different coming which is which is uh you know the end of the scene mm. and it, it just sort of turns on a sixpence it's it's very fleet of foot all of these scenes contain almost all these scenes contain multiple scenes and multiple directions and you're saying you know this could be all completely played for comedy this scene um, but also there are serious things undergoing, serious plot things going on as well. And in the same way as the earlier scenes, are they serious? Where do we place the comedy uh, in them? Uh, we have, you know, maybe this, the pendulum swung a little bit the other way, but then also there's a lot of room for manoeuvre to play around with, with what's underlying it as well. Um, I've, I've, you know, I'm, I'm really liking about the potential for this play. The fact we haven't, come out of this going we know exactly where to go with this we're enjoying it i think um but um it's it's it hasn't yielded all its secrets uh lynn i thought i saw a hand earlier um yes i was just thinking about alan's comment earlier about oh we're gonna the the kings are saying this is not a a, a question for ordinary people we're gonna have the aristos settle it but they can't, they, can't, they can't do it. The citizens are definitely a player in this political game. You, um, you can't be king without some um, popular consent. The king must rule by consent. Uh, and, and so as much as the Aristos dislike it, they have to include the citizens in this, in this game. They, that, they're definitely, ordinary people are definitely a player. It's just... Yeah, um, and I think Eric uh, said in the in the chat. I don't know if Eric's got uh, got any uh, thoughts he wants to jump in with now. Um, well, you know, that we're almost chorus like at one one moment uh, the way they were functioning. Uh, any thoughts? Uh, generally, we're moving in very we're very much in extra time now, so we're going sort of to final thoughts about the play so far. Anything uh, you want to uh, say, Eric? 
Well, I was going to add that it at some point it sounded almost pantomime because we know that like everyone would not, no one would support like the King of France. So he's like the bad guy. <laughs> but then King John rises up to sort of match his level of like, well, not idiocy, but sort of like his level of, um, like he's antagonistic about like, you know, this is for England, you know, we want Angier, we want Toulouse, so on and so forth. But they have to sort of agree to disagree. <laughs> because of the people um but I, I don't know it just had elements of pantomime where like you know you're going yeah that's the villain <laughs> that's definitely the villain <laughs> i don't know maybe that was just me mm, no I, I think it's a it's a good point the, the question of tone and actually performance and um is, is one we're still you know we're constantly wrestling with actually you know pantomime comes up a lot in our discussions uh as an analog for elements of a lot of these plays uh and um you know we can use that to to deny it or affirm it or or play with it at different times uh, uh the way the way the uh, signs are functioning i'm you know the the extended aside where people are standing around waiting for it to finish fast i, I really haven't seen a signs functioning like that in the plays we've looked at so far i don't think so maybe a couple there might be one or two. I'll have to dredge that out of the memory. Um, Aliki, uh, uh, you look like you were uh, unmuting with intent. Uh, was, uh, was that wrong? Um, it, it wasn't really about this play as such. I, I, I'm interested in this question of pantomime because it's the only frame of reference we have for a very lively uh, interactive relationship with the audience. And I think, I think the trick would be to develop our own level of that kind of relationship mm. because uh, you pantomime you fall into really bad habits it's just it becomes a dead end <laughs> yeah I, I think the idea the problem is you you the temptation is to mock the text while you're 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 yeah. doing it which we you know is not the intent especially when the text is is functioning incredibly well uh in in this mm. uh, this instance so far uh only only a quarter of the way through people yep there's still time um <laughs> Uh, Stephen, did you want to jump in? Well, just to, yeah, just to follow that on, really, that um, I did see this done by Red Not Dead about five or six years ago, and the thing that came out from that really was pace. So when people talking about tone, they managed they managed to really get it along a, a lick, and let the tone look after itself. Mm. Mm. Uh, and um, you know, when we think about pace, we think about energy, which is a, maybe another way of thinking about what Aliki is talking about, where the energy is is not necessarily coming from loads and loads of interaction with the audience, but with uh, just the kind of uh, charged physicality of people getting on, getting off, moving very quickly. They did it as a, as a traverse with a, with a kind of gallery. Uh, and so people were you know, going from one end, of the, one end of the room to the other all the time and back again. And, and having that kind of a you know, good run at it, as it were, literally stop people from standing around talking because they were always on the way somewhere it was kind of almost like a play of indoor and outdoor corridors if you like mm. that's really interesting because otherwise it could be really static i mean except for the the excursions and whatever we've had quite a lot of people just standing around talking about who's right is what and marriages and stuff and there's a lot at stake. You know, people are really trying, they're trying to hold on to their positions of power. Everyone, it's all, it's a constant shit. Uh, Stephen mentioned status games. Um, you know, everybody is trying to uh, assert a status. Um, and, uh, you know, at the moment, King John is not necessarily um, asserting a particularly high status in, in, many, in many ways. Uh, not necessarily a low one, but um, there's an awful lot of people talking and trying to get themselves uh, in positions. Mm. And it was interesting for me doing Arthur, um, where I got a reasonable amount of text, was, yeah, he wanted to move fast. I didn't want to have, hang around. I mean, it was just a sight read, so, you know, we're only getting ideas. Um, we very much are into extra time. I'm not going to go around the whole room uh, for final thoughts, but uh, we are in that sort of area. So, um, uh, Lois, I saw a hand. Mm. Uh, yeah, actually, I saw the same production Stephen was mentioning, and it did go extremely fast. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think it's also perhaps a bit more complex. I'm not sure that the audience would necessarily think the French were the bad guys, given that it, it seems to me pretty obvious that Arthur's claim to the throne is better than John's. I mean, he is the son of uh, John's older brother. Uh, also, I think the 
uh, in the question of tone, that initial diplomatic uh, uh, message from uh, Chatillion goes in amazingly quickly. I mean, would the audience ever have believed that a, an ambassador arrives and says, you know, we, we, we're supporting Arthur's claim to the throne. Would you mind giving your throne up? No? Okay, goodbye. We're going to make war. Exit. I mean, it's incredibly fast. Uh, uh, it, it's hard not to see it as comic, but presumably it, it, it just has such edge, uh, such drive to it. And I, I think the rest of the play kind of takes its uh, tone from that. Mm, yes, there, there is that sense of, if it is comedy, it feels a lot like satire a lot of the time. Um, I really found interesting with Arthur, reading Arthur again, um, is that he doesn't say very much and he's not really leading anything. He's just this, this uh, the pawn to be moved around by other more powerful players. Um, uh, and, and so that feels very interesting there. His claim might be right, but he doesn't have power uh in his own right um and that's that's really interesting uh sarah did you do you have any final final things to throw in yeah i d I, I well i thought what lois said about edge i thought that was a really good word to use about this play and uh, i think it was aliki said uh, made a reference to house of cards in the chat earlier and that's what I'm really, really enjoying about this. Yes, okay, there are times when it could tip into comedy, I suppose, but I actually think this is a really corking um, political satire. It's got tons of pace, it's got tons of ambiguity, so there is so much you could do with it, so many lovely artistic choices you could make with it if you were staging it, and it's just got some delicious irony in it, and um, I'm really enjoying it. Yes, I think the irony card is going to be played strongly in this. Uh, Alexandra, do you have any uh, last thoughts? Yes, I agree with Sarah. I think that if you if you play it seriously, and actually with with something you said earlier, Rob, about um, how there's there's I don't know what the word you used was, but um, there's there's a, a huge amount of intention uh, in this. I think that's what drives uh, the the story is that everybody wants things and they want them really badly, and uh, stakes is is the word you used, and stakes is the other thing. So if if you put on a production where the stakes and the and the drive is there enormously when there are moments that are funny they will be additionally funny by the fact that we're not trying to play the whole thing as a comedy you're getting these these shafts of light in otherwise uh, something that for the characters is important and terrifying and and you know um serious that the characters are treating seriously um and yes i think that irony particularly would come out in glorious ways um, done like that. Yeah, uh, th 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 you know, it's, it's, it's very Breaking Bad in that sense. You know, the characters in that are trapped in a farce, but it's a deadly, deadly serious one. Um, uh, as, as, as they get more and more desperate and, and, and things, so there might be, might be an element of that, as well as the West Wing. I don't know. Um, I, don't, I think it's, more, it's far too cynical to be the West Wing, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> House of Cards was probably right. Um, uh, Lynn, do you have anything uh, to close on? Uh, yes. So the, this text seems really interested in the question of wherein monarchy consists and is there, I mean, the, the phrase, the divine right of king, of course, isn't invoked, although Philip does call himself by grace of God, king of France. So we know from the, the bastards, first long monologue that that there is a sort of supernatural world he intuits that he's um the the uh legit the natural son of a former king so the so we you know this isn't a completely secular cynical world but on the other hand it seems to say the king of england is whoever er, whoever um, can manipulate the circumstances best. The idea of actual some kind of like ontological legitimacy doesn't seem to, to count for who gets to rule. Mm. If that makes any sense, which it probably doesn't. <laughs> mm. um, Alan, uh, anything final? Um, yeah, I mean, it, I think Peel and the Queen's men did have this knack of getting things which moved at one hell of a lick. And I think it has to be played at that pace to make it work. Um, and I think we've got, from the bit we've done so far, which is what, about a third of the place, 
the page count, um, it does seem to be getting someplace fairly rapidly. Hmm. Um, uh, Eric, do you have anything at uh, final uh, for for the room? I, I was just going to say that um, like there are a lot of obviously interesting characters, um, you know, in the kings and stuff, but also. Um, I think it was Constance who started off like with sort of hoping that, you know, there's not going to be a war. And then by the end of this bit, she's like, I mean, like by the end of scene, you know, two or three, she's kind of like, you know, she wants to go at them basically, <laughs> which is quite a change. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Um, I think I've gone, although I haven't formally gone around everyone, uh, I've gone around most people uh, quite a lot. Anyone dying to say anything final uh, who hasn't had a chance? We've got three more sessions. So if you're here uh, for the next time, then you can add more in for then. Uh, so all that remains then is to uh, thank everyone for this first session looking at the troublesome rain. It hasn't been particularly troublesome for us. We've enjoyed it enormously. Um, uh, but um, there are three more sessions uh, to go and I uh, hope that you can join us. Thanks to all the readers and goodbye. Bye. Bye.